Welcome back to our ninth lecture in Applied Statistics and Probability for Engineers. We have already talked quite a bit on what a confidence interval is and how to calculate it and how to calculate it with both a z-value and a t-value, but now we're going to turn our focus on how to use confidence intervals in hypothesis testing. So most of the time in real practice I have a set value of alpha not of my critical values. So if I want to minimize alpha or if I want to minimize my type 1 error then I am going to flat out from the beginning state what that alpha is. So here I'm going to say I want an alpha of 0.05 and from that alpha I'm then going to calculate these two critical values. So this is the opposite calculation that I've done before. Before I had critical values and I found an alpha based on that. In confidence interval calculations I'm going to be given an alpha and I want to calculate what these critical values are based on that. So we call this interval right here the values between my lower critical value and my upper critical value. I'm going to call that interval right there my confidence interval. And in general, I am going to state the level of my confidence interval. So it's either going to be 90, 95, or 99 percent. So 95 is a good value that you'll see a lot. So with the 95 percent confidence interval, what that means is that I am 95 percent confident that my true value will exist between these two critical values. Or I am 95 percent confident that mu naught is going to exist somewhere in this area. So if you notice these over here, I have alpha values, which are alpha over 2, because it's a two-tailed test, alpha over 2. So my critical regions, or my rejection regions, are half of my alpha, because they have to share the total significance level. So that puts this unshaded region as my confidence level, or 95%. Another way to think about that is it really is 1 minus alpha. So if you remember the definition of a bell curve or a normal distribution, the entire area under the bell curve will equal 1. So when I have 1 minus my alpha, that would give me 95%, meaning that I'm 95% confident that my true value will exist between my lower critical value here and my upper critical value here. Okay, so I need to find my lower limit, or my L, and my upper limit, or my upper critical value, U, given an alpha level. Okay, so I am not going to re-go through this whole slide. I just wanted to revisit it briefly so that you guys remember what we're doing and how to calculate confidence intervals. So if you remember, for a one-sided interval, I would be looking at these formulas over here. For a two-sided interval, then, I would be looking at these formulas over here. So the ones on this page have z values, but remember you can also do this using t values if it calls for it. Okay, so now let's talk about how confidence intervals relate to hypothesis testing. So when we're given a particular test where h not equals mu or and the alternative is that they do not equal each other, we would then calculate the confidence interval so for an observed value of mu at the desired level of confidence. If mu naught is not within the confidence interval, we would then reject the null hypothesis. This can also be calculated for one-sided tests. This is just an example with a two-sided test. So let's look at an example of this. So let's look at the same example we did last chapter when we talked about confidence intervals. This time we are now going to approach it with comparing a confidence interval in a hypothesis test. Laura claims that the average score for the final exam is less than 60%. You gather a sample of 51 test papers and calculate the sample average to be 57% and the population standard deviation to be 12%. Test Laura's claim using a 99% confidence interval. Okay, so ultimately we need to find a 99% confidence interval and then compare Laura's sample average of 57 to see if it's within that confidence interval or not. Okay, so let's kind of write out what we know. The average test score is less than 60%. So my null hypothesis is going to be that mu or my population average equals 60%. Then my alternative hypothesis is mu is less than 60%. Alpha equals 0.01 because I'm told I have a confidence interval of 99%. And then let's look at a picture of what we're trying to solve. We are saying that there is some critical value right here that we can solve using our confidence interval approach. 
and that we are going to look at values below that value right there and those values would be rejected. Everything else in the body of this graph would then fail to reject my null hypothesis. Okay, so let's first of all find my critical value. So I draw the bell curve as I always do and I say mu equals 60 with sigma equaling 12. So I'm going to draw what's going on here. I'm going to have this little tail over here where alpha equals 1%. So the rest of my body of this graph is going to equal 99%. So I need to find that critical value so I know whether to reject or fail to reject my null hypothesis. So I start out with my equation mu minus z sub a times my standard error. And notice this time it's not z sub alpha over 2 because it's just a one-sided test. So when I look at that z sub a, I need to keep this in mind. I'm going to look at my 1 minus alpha, or my confidence coefficient, of being 99%. So I can find the interval from here over to the right, so I can compare my value with that confidence interval. So let's go to my z table again and find 99%, because that's what 1 minus alpha is. So I then find that that is 2.33. So I plug that in my formula, and I get the value of 56.08. I then label that on my graph, 56.08, so I can use that to compare a value. So then my confidence interval would be that mu is greater than or equal to 56.08. Next step is I'm going to compare what Laura thinks the sample average is. So she said that the sample average is 57%. So I'm going to draw that on my graph so I can get a visual of what's going on. And as you can see, this 57% is greater than my critical value, or it's within my confidence interval. So we know that since it is greater than my critical value, we will fail to reject H0. Or since it is within my confidence interval, I would fail to reject H0. Meaning that we are 99% confident that our true value of our test average is going to be greater than or equal to 56.08. So we're not going to reject our null hypothesis based on a 57% test score. Another way to think about this is that my null hypothesis then was that mu equaled 60. So really I'm not necessarily accepting the fact that mu equals 60 or that my average equals 60, but I'm failing to reject the idea that it's 60. Meaning I don't have enough proof to show me that it isn't 60, so for now I'm keeping it. And that's true, right? We are showing that this value of 60 is within my confidence interval. So it's not necessarily that my average equals 60, but we fail to reject the fact that it's 60, or we accept the idea that it might be 60 just because it is within my confidence interval.